if you see one of our department representatives in the room and you have questions you would like to ask of them afterwards, you'll know who to beeline over to. Uh, so we kind of have um, a number of our departments represented in the back. Uh, we have Lieutenant Stokes um, with our police department. And standing next to him is uh, Stephanie Galbraith. Actually, Stephanie grew up in this square mile, so, uh, but she is our cri in crime prevention and um, she can help you if you have issues in your neighborhood and you would like to hear about some of our programs that bring some, a safer neighborhood. Uh, Stephanie is a person to um, talk with. Uh, standing next to him, he is golf course and he is kind of our host tonight. So if you will please join me in giving him a hand for thanking him. Thank you. And it is a great golf director of fun. Uh, Steve Sidaway, he's our parks director. And Del Boathouse is our public works director. And so he oversees engineering, he oversees uh, many of our inspections of our units, usually when they are, they're big, and then the phone calls go to him. <laughs> uh, Deputy Chief Charlie Butterfield is with our fire department. Um, I do have um, office staff here. Robert Simison is around the corner, and, and Jody St. Martin is in the very back. She's our community liaison. So we do have... Our city clerk is sitting over here. Um, he oversees all of our public meetings and our public to the answer that you need. We do have two city council members here as well. Ann Lil Roberts, raise your hand, Ann. And Ty Palmer in the very back. So have I have a couple of guests. There are local issues on your ballot and we thought we should provide you an opportunity to ask questions um, of the folks that are here to talk about the um, College of Western Idaho levy. Uh, Gary Hunter will ingrained in our transportation system. He is here to talk to you about the Ada County Highway District registration fee. And then we'll get to the questions that established our agenda. So at this point, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Gary and um, communication and governmental affairs. He's going to chat with you a little bit about an exciting uh, project that we have going on the College of Western Idaho and then I'm going to stick around and answer any questions that you might have. So at this time, Mark Browning, our Vice President. Thanks for having me out tonight. Uh, Gary, thank you. I, I feel so formal because everybody knows him as Bear, so it's just, it's Bear. So scouts in the back, can, can I just deviate just for a minute to the scouts? Where are we at? <coughs> All right. You get knocked down for that. Life Scout? Okay, very good. How many Eagle Scouts in the room? Two? Three? All right. Outstanding. Thank you. So, thank you for going up in Montana to be part of the scouting program. And I learned. I had opportunities and exposure to get education about a number of different topics such that I was able to earn the Eagle Scout Award at age 14. I was really fortunate. I had great lead things about a number of different topics to serve a wide range of folks. So for those of us uh, that were here in the Valley back in 2007, the voters of Ada and Canyon County voted to establish the College of Western Idaho, a two-year community college. And the college opened its doors. What's our date today? October 24th, 24th, 23rd, something like that. Never argue with the mayor. If she says it's the 23rd, it's the 23rd. <laughs> Plus she's Dutch, so you don't, you don't argue with Dutch. I'm married to a Dutch woman, so you don't argue with Dutch, okay? Have lots of students with lots of great ideas, with lots of potential, and no place to put them. Our biggest need is in the health sciences. So. I'm not going to call out folks, but those of us who happen to be of that special demographic where things we kind of wear out, access to health care is a very big part of our lives. That is a huge need 
in our community. And you can see the growth in the hospitals with St. Luke's, with St. Al's, with uh, the, the different medical centers that, uh, that are uh, popping up all over the place. We have a times the rate of the regular population in this area. We've all read the stories from Forbes that we're the fastest growing state in the union, right? Meridian right here in the central, right in the heart of it, right? Everybody's flooding in here. And here we are at age 65 and older growing. Right now, we're able to graduate about 80 nurses a year. The state of Idaho has a need for 1,100. There's eight schools across the state that are producing nurses, public and private. We are not even coming close to meeting the demand. In the Department of Labor team, by the year 2020, we're going to need 2,100 more than what we have today, and on and on and on, to the point where we have a gap of 10,000 healthcare workers that's going to be needed in, within the next decade. And at 80 nurses a year, we're just not getting there. We're limited. The concept is, is when you get up in the morning and go take your shift, someone else is coming in off their shift, and they take your bunk. We essentially hot caught our nurse program. So one class goes out of the lab and goes into the, to the room for lecture. We bring another lab class in, and we do that. From where we're really limited is in facilities. We have physical limitations in the facility. We can do a lot of things digitally online, and we do, but I don't know about you. I'm, I'm type 2 diabetic, and so when I have to go have my blood drawn every three months to make sure that I'm doing the things that I'm not supposed to be doing, jobs and some careers that really require a lot of face-to-face -face and hand-to-hand -hand instruction, nursing being one of those. And that's where we're limited with a facility. We can only just move so many people through. So we're asking for help. In November of 2016, we laid out a vision. It haven't gone away, but we went and we held eight different public meetings just like this. We were fortunate enough that uh, the mayor let us use some space over at City Hall and we had folks came, come out and we asked, you know, what are you willing to do? Here's what we need to have done. And folks, almost to a person, afford to do it all at once. What's your number one priority? What's your number one need? And for us, to meet the need of our local employers, especially in health care, is by far and away, without question, our number one need. And we needed that building to get it done. So we said, OK, one at a time, let's get this done. So we pulled everything in the building. It's $49 million. It's 105,000 square feet, four floors. It will go on the main campus just off Idaho Center Boulevard, just a little west of here. We have spent the last year, year and a half, working with the Idaho legislature to get $10 million in seed money. A tax base that comes through continued employment here. The governor and the legislature said, you know what, you're right. Now, with our friends down at the Capitol, there's always a little bit of fine print. And the fine print that came along was, we'll give you 10 million bucks, but you gotta raise the other 39 by June, somewhere between three and five years, and we'll raise that money, and we won't have to go and ask. We can't have pledges or commitments or, or uh, uh, any kinds of things like that. It has to be a tangible in the bank money by June 30th. That's why we've got to come out and ask you folks for help. The second amount of time, we don't need another 30 year bond that's hanging on the books forever. What's the least amount of money you need and then ask for the least amount of time. So that's where we're at. We're with a 10 year plant facility levy. So at the end of 10 years, when this kicks in in 2019 and 2029, it's living here in Meridian. What's our average home price, Mayor? 275, 300 ish? 320? We've had a good year, haven't we? So if it's 320, we back the first 100 off, that's $220,000 of taxable value. The increase is eight for the entire year. That's what we're asking for your help. So that's the nuts and bolts of what we're asking for. Um, from the college perspective, we have to be very careful. There's state law that says that I can't stand up here and, and advocate for our project. What we are required now, as my partner over here reminded me, he goes, hey, you're after hours, you're off the clock. You can advocate all you want. And yes, I can, but I'm not going to because I'm one of those guys that I want to stay to the inside of the road and I want to stay far away from the edge of that road and not drop off and get myself in trouble. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to Gary Hunter, AC at the college and it helps us stay out of trouble. So Gary, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you. Thank you very much, Mark, and I'll make this very quick. Uh, as a state employee, as he just identified himself, he cannot ask you to vote yes on this proposition. I'm a volunteer. Had a conversation recently with the county clerk who told me that 40% of the people who vote, who actually vote, don't get to the last page. And the bad news for us, we're on the back 
of the, of the last page. So if you are so inclined to head back and go to the front. Now, if you're not so inclined, go ahead and start in the front and work your way through. Uh, fantastic project. I had an individual the other day when I was speaking to a Lions Club said, you know, Bear, I pay more in a bond. It goes away in 10 years. And uh, Mayor, I think we've covered it. I said we'd try to be quick. Are there any questions about th Yes. Don't know that. Mark? Great question. Planning for the future. So also, when ICOM started the bid, it was basically two years of construction, but the planning started two years. Planning right now, we don't have plans for the fourth floor. The reason for that is we don't know what to put in there just yet. Now, Ben's looking at me like, that's not a very good answer. Here's why. When we talk with the folks at Luke's and Al's and West Valley, they don't know if things are changing, so we want to leave some flexibility. But, but Ty, the answer to your question, which was a good one, is the increased cost in instruction. The second half of that is, what we've all heard is that um, City of Boise had a fire department that they can't afford to finish, right? Is that the one? So what are you guys going to do when you're going to run out and say, this is the home I want to build, and I'm going to build it, whatever the cost runs are going to be, or this is how much money I have, and I'll build as much home as I can for that building. We know that hopefully we will have $49 million to work with. We will build what we can build for equipment that will be needed to help uh, put it in. Yes, in the back. Yes. Let me, let me just give you one more, and I, I know Mayor's anxious, but there's about 1,800 students with a budget of $57 million. The College of Western Idaho serves 33,000 students with a budget of $66 million. We're very proud of our fiscal responsibility and for the amount of work and the amount of people that we're able to serve and help to stay in this area. I have one, one more bit of information. Don't give me. Thank you, Mark. One other fact that I'd like you to know. It, takes, it will take a 55% majority uh, to pass this, and that will be a blended vote of both Ada and Canyon Counties. Majority of 67%, it's 55. So with that, if there are no further questions, yep. Yes, sir. Well, the state is your bond for the building. The answer to the, to the second question is yes, the legislature could bond for it, but it's tricky because the College of Western Idaho has five locally elected trustees. It is, is, is treated by code the same as what a school district is. It would make it really, really tricky to navigate those waters. It has been done in the past. So for those of us who were around in 2001, then Governor Kempthorne pushed a bonding program through for all of higher education and two community colleges that were in existence at the time can be done. The answer to the first part of the question is we'll go back to the drawing board and try to figure something out. We would have another opportunity to go in May. Uh, we'd have to significantly rework the project. It would not allow us to meet those employer needs at even what we're projecting now, which is an increase of about 25. Um, it's not ideal. We need to get things done because we have those of us who uh, knock on wood are not going to be there tomorrow, but at some point going to need significant health care. We need trained people to take care of us. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. I have Charlie Roundtree here that will talk about the Ada County Highway District registration fee that is also on your ballot. Good evening. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you all for being here. Uh, I've been watching you as previous presentation. You all, before I do hypnotize you, vote yes on the vehicle registration increase. I'm Charlie Roundtree. I am the co-chair of the committee, Citizens for Better Transportation. In July, registration fee. 
The vehicle registration fee is an option available to Ada County and Ada County Highway District only because they're the only countywide highway district in the state of Idaho. And that's provided for in the, in the state statute. Want to have better roads? Do you want improvements? And if so, here's a way to help do that. The uh, initiative is asking for uh, fees that will be exclusively used to provide additional congestion relief, undertake major roads. We'll talk about what the fee increase is here in a moment, but the, the, all the fees raised will go for capital improvements. No administration. I know people have been talking about ACHD building a new uh, administrative building. The money won't go there. It will go to red lights on a left-hand turn at intersections for years and years and years. Now we get to get through them occasionally with a yellow arrow. That's the kind of project that these, this money will provide. It'll, it'll provide turn lanes. It'll provide uh, additional lane capacity. It will provide for sidewalks in areas that do not have sidewalks that are on routes to schools. It will provide bike lanes on roads that don't have bike lanes, on sorts of things. The amount of money raised with this particular initiative will be about seven and a half million dollars a year. Now that doesn't sound like chump change to me, but when you're talking about a 1.6 Ada County and Canyon County, we plan together, we plan transportation together in those two counties. In the two counties, on an annual basis, there's $235 million worth of unfunded projects. This fee increase will generate, will take a, a minor chunk out of that. But we'll do things that will make your left-hand turns easier, make your si signal progressions better, and hopefully get you. That's what it'll do. What's happened in Meridian? Well, in the last 10 years, Meridian has had 21 projects funded by this program, the, the previous the historic program. I should tell you about that. Um, the, in 2008, there was a similar a ballot in the time period. In that time period, Meridian has received 21 projects out of that funding, and, and that total funding uh, increase in that time period was $24.6 million. So, we got a, a number of, so what's this fee going to be all about? Well, it's not big. To give you an example, and it's, it's based on the age of your vehicle. You all, you currently pay a local fee of $40. That's just the local portion. There's several other portions in that fee. With the new fee, you'll be paying $70 on an annual basis. Now you're paying $36. With the new fee, you'd be paying $63. That's seven cents a day. The average vehicle in Ada County is seven years or older. Now you're paying 20 a day. So that's, that's what we're asking for. Um, the, the reason I'm doing this, and it's another pitch I'll make tonight, is I'm on the task force for the city's comprehensive plan update. And I was reviewing so far, and I got a phone call and said, Charlie, I need your help. And I said, I don't do that anymore. Oh, I, we really need you to come out and support this. And I said, what am I supporting? This vehicle registration fee. What is it I'm going to have to do? Oh, you won't have to do anything. Comments I read at that point, and when I got the phone call that evening, in excess of 95% of the comments that people have provided about all sorts of things in Meridian, about what they wanted and what they liked, was that the congestion, but I'm, I'm reading what the people are telling me. I've seen what the surveys have told the city. I've seen what the surveys have told Ada County Highway District. And I said, this is, this is no, no big deal. It's, it's a winner. Next to the CWI, an initiative on the ballot, but I do know they change those around, so we might be on the third page instead of the fourth page. To find it, it's ballot initiative to raise the registration fee 
for Ada County Highway District, your highway projects in the county. Any questions? So I'm not going to put you on the spot, but I'll use me as an example. Okay. I own three vehicles, and I pay a registration fee on all three of them. And I usually pay them seven bicycles, and they all get ridden. I figure I pay my share for my bicycles. Now, I expect you didn't ride your bikes over here tonight. You might have walked like I did. But part of what property taxes, whatever, pays for the bicycle facilities as an amenity to all of us that, that use the bicycles and to people who don't use bicycles because you've got the bicycles out of the lanes. So prioritization done by Ada County Highway District and made on, made on the most needed first. And if it's, an, if it's a, say, adding new lanes, uh, for instance, uh, Franklin, they, they rebuilt monies to build the bike lanes, and then they used their regular property tax base monies to rebuild the lanes that were there. So I don't, I don't know what percentage of that project was built in the last 10 years with, with these funds, but there have been a few. I've heard, I've heard it's something on the order of about 10% of the money but I don't know that for sure. Yes, sir. Uh, is, this, is this a registration going to be part of the statute? It's not, it's not up to ACHD how they, it's the is statute. Based, does that have anything to do with? It's uh, based on the age of the vehicle. I, as far as I know, it's, it's I, I think hybrids, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if somebody else does. This gentleman doesn't think they do, so I don't, I don't know. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, every, every house that they sell <coughs> generates an impact fee to Ada County Highway District. And, that, and, and some of that the city will cover, but those, those fees are are used to build, they don't rebuild, come from some other, but they, but they pay an impact fee, every new business uh, that comes to town pays an impact fee to uh, Ada County Highway District. How high can you stand? <laughs> Well, all, all all the new all the new vehicles that come to town will be paying that same fee. Every every vehicle. In trouble. <laughs> Any other questions? I don't want to deal with impact fees. Yes, ma'am.
well, I'm, I'm not a rule maker. ACHD is not a rule maker by age of vehicle. And that's how it is in statute. So that's the method that ACHD has to uh, bring this forward in terms of is it pu publicly supported? And if so, uh, vote for it. If you don't publicly. Other questions? Thank you all. So we received more than 30 questions, and we've tried to group them um, as follow-ups to that question. Um, we'll entertain them at that time. If, if not, uh, we will get additional questions unrelated at the end. So our first question. But we have a common theme here, and I'm going to first talk about planning. Uh, Charlie ta or touched on it a little bit. Um, in terms of he's on our comprehensive plan steering committee. Right now we are in the midst of a comprehensive plan uppers every 10 years. And the last update was done in 2012. So uh, the funding is underway and it is comprehensive. It's going through the entire plan and the land use map. The land use is so critical to have our citizens weigh in. And we have been getting good participation, but I would encourage you to go on to meridiancity.org slash comp plan and read up on it. You can see an 18 month process. Um, as part of that plan, we use it as a gu guiding document and um, decisions are made to that plan and that will address where Meridian for more than 20 years. Okay, you'll see that in Meridian uh, over that time, you had to have rooftops before you got the shopping and the retail. And so in North Meridian, um, the comprehensive plan will designate where those um, retail and employment and industrial components all go. As well, schools and traffic congestion are also um, discussing where facilities should go as far as schools are, and also in terms of width of roadways. Because what we don't want to do is to um, build something in a future. Uh, all of these are in the guiding document of our population growth and as far as infrastructure outside of just roads, uh, we are, are planning well ahead on our water and sewer. Uh, we have been ahead of that. So developers do um, build the infrastructure. Uh, they don't get reimbursed. The hookups to that are, are collected from new growth. So in our infrastructure for water and sewer, um, that is facilities when, when they're um, done. So any follow-up questions on this? It is a very big question and some of them will drill down a little bit further. If not, I'll, I'll move to the next one. Will Meridian consider impact fees for seemingly that is allowed by law? So we collect impact fees for our parks and um, if you want to get into the, the complicated process of, of figuring out impact fees, uh, we do have our findings in depth, but impact fees pay for capital. Road um, impact fees, and it is for roads only. Uh, sidewalks are not a part of that, but I'll get into some of that in a couple of questions further in. Um, Impact fees are pretty much collected on water and sewer. Those are more assessments or, or hookup. Uh, so we collect what we can as allowed by law for um, growth to pay for itself. Growth will then catch up and start paying their share of the property tax that funds more the operational and, and personnel costs. And I would ask council anything you want to add on that? 
okay, what the city owns, and um, I think it's more about what do developers do. And so the city owns all of our public buildings, city hall, the police department, our fire station, uh, a number of capital assets. Um, I don't think that that is necessarily what this question was about. It's who pays for what. So in new growth, developers put in local roads, not on the cost of, they put in sidewalks and street lights. They put in for residential, they are required 10% or more open space. They lay their water and sewer lines and they par pay the park or park police and, and fire impact that little piece. It's not paid ahead of time. It is paid as growth occurs. Um, so I, I guess that was my interpretation. I will get to that in another question. But good question. It seems like all of us feel the same way about growth. Why aren't our elected officials listening? <laughs> so, I, I will tell you that the comprehensive plan and our designated area of impact is established, and when it's established, you establish a property right. So, uh, those property owners have a right to develop their property per the plan that is adopted with public input and as long as services, if it, it does not, that is not in our realm of authority. We get comments from the school district and we get comments from the road district. We don't do roads, we don't Well, I, I will tell you that you have an elected board of trustees for the school district. They determine class sizes and when new facilities will be put out for a bond for the citizens to pass. And I might as well get into that right now too. Right. So the state legislature does not allow impact fees to be collected for schools. Yeah, you have to turn that off. I'm it's trying. just going to give feedback. I'll, I'll share my mic with you. Um, the only thing that schools have is that they go to their, their citizens to um, build new facilities. That with all the building that is going on in the city of Meridian, all the apartments that are covered, that our schools are not overcrowded? Is that what the school board is telling you? The school board is telling us that the, the schools are above capacity, but they do not tell us they cannot accept them. Because the state, well, I, I, it's, I, I would love to get into that, but I'm not on their board. And how do we, how do we find out about that then? What, what's the best procedure? To go to the school? The, I, I guess the, the best way, uh, public education. Right, exactly. But so, well, we'll, we'll talk about it afterwards, oh, off offline. Okay. Um, City Council, anything you would like to add? Uh, th that the things that the city handles are taken care of if we're going to approve a project. Um, I mean, there's questions or even clarity from our city attorney that we cannot necessarily make a decision based on another elected board's ability to provide every project that we approve. Um, the parks are at the appropriate level. The water continues to flow. The s toilets continue to flush. And so everything... And again, that's that's not the, the city. We don't own the roads. If we did, we'd probably do things a little bit differently. But where we don't own the roads, we don't collect the funds. The and that's when I take off my city council hat and I join you as a citizen, and we work on that together. 
but as a city council, my job is to make sure that the, when the toilet's flush, it goes away. When you turn the faucet on, the water comes out, and that the grass is still green at the parks. Talk about the conundrum that the, the city finds itself in. We are the center of the Treasure Valley. The impact that our developments create for traffic is not what is, is causing the congestion on our roads as well. If you see a lot of the growth in the outlying communities, they don't see the congestion we do because they're only dealing with their own traffic. We're dealing with every car in the valley because they, let's um, charge a toll at the county, county line. Because when I pull out of my subdivision, I see 2C license plates all over. But we can't do that. And that is why we plan as a valley um, our to drive through it. With our comprehensive plan update, we are trying to bring services closer to where people live. We're trying to bring employment centers closer to where people live that would be working there. And you can cut down some of those trips that go through you because they're going to their job and then back home. We're working with the city of Nampa in um, our land use to make sure that to get a family wage job. And really, at this point, they're working in downtown Boise and they're living in Caldwell. And they have to get home and they have to get to work and they're traveling through us. It is our traffic, but it is. That registration fee is a regional solution for Ada County. It is a user pays. The user of the cars should pay for the roads. And that is the fairest form of, of paying. And we do hope that our citizens engage because you see things change when you engage. And I can give you several examples. Ten Mile Interchange, I was told when I first got on council, when I became mayor, went on a list. And any time we had an opportunity to, to weigh in on a program that was going to be part of a solution, that list was informed. I didn't tell you how to call your or the, the gas tax increase because our citizens engaged and they said, we need these improvements. They worked with our elected officials to make sure that it happened. So they have started participating and being comments on our transportation improvement plan when we're allowed to comment. And you are inundating them with something needs to happen. They gave us the STAR legislation, which is sales tax reimburse or sales tax anticipated revenue. And that is from a development that puts in the road ahead of time and is paid back by the every innovative tool the state gives us, in addition to public private partnerships. A lot of the intersections in the in North Meridian were all built by development and reimbursed through their impact fee. So make things happen. Um, we are one of the only areas in the state of Idaho that does not have road authority. And it makes it essential that we work with both the county and Okay, we'll get into apartments in a minute because we have a whole section on that with other cities. Uh, we're involved with the Association of Idaho Cities. We go to the National League of Cities. I'm involved in the Community Leaders of America and we do talk about growth. And we do look at best practices from other regions. Um, go and I talk to planning departments and I talk to mayors because I'm curious to how other cities deal with their growth related issues as well. Apartments. Caleb. I, I will tell you, so Caleb is our, uh, we don't have as many apartments as we seem to. 
so a softball. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, apartments. Uh, so we'll read uh, the questions here. Why are so many apartment projects uh, being built? I, I can't. Um, some of it has to do with uh, the housing stock. So uh, up until recently, and, and we're starting to, I'll give you some ratios here in a little bit, but we're single family dominated. Uh, we had about 12 and a half percent of our housing stock has been multifamily up until around 2010. Uh, part of the reason for that was bank family homes. We were still building some single family homes, um, but we're kind of catching back up, if you will, with that ratio. Um, so that's one of the reasons. Uh, the other reason, and, and this kind of goes hand in hand with that, is uh, it was mentioned earlier, I think, when CWI was talking, uh, the cost of homes is up. So not everybody can afford more, and the down payment is a little bit, and again, it's more anecdotal than really scientific, um, but there, some of the demographics are changing as well. We've got smaller house sizes, um, whether you're th the younger generation just getting out of school and starting a job, uh, a lot of more, lot of young professional singles, uh, today are 3% of the housing stock, 3%. Um, and just for reference, there's about 40,000 dwelling units in Meridian, about 110,000 people, uh, a little over two and a half uh, people on average per household. So if you want a small nationwide, and in our area too, but really nationwide. So again, if you want something that's smaller, typically that's what apartments are, generally ones and two beds, with some threes occasionally, but they're, and then single family homes, just to give you the rest of that ratio then, um, fifty-four percent of our housing stock is three-bedroom units and forty-three units. Um, I will just a couple of other numbers that I thought were interesting uh, as looking at some of these questions uh, preparing today. In 1990, now granted, we the the ratio uh, is a little bit skewed because of the the total number of dwelling units in Meridian in 1990 was about 3,900, right? And we're at four. Um, so again, if you look at it just as a ratio perspective, and then 2,000, uh, we had. Uh, a little over 12,000 dwelling units, with 85% of them being single family and 15% being uh, multifamily. And then the last number I'll throw at you, at least for right now, in 2015, we have, and somewhat catching back up, if you will. Um, I will also just let you know in my profession, there really isn't a standard. It's not like, you know, 15% is a healthy standard or 20% is a healthy standard. Um, it really does kind of vary by community to community, but I will let you know 15 is not uncommon, 20, 25 in a lot of, a lot of places is. So if you put that into the three, the, we're, we're definitely moving towards that ratio of increasing apartments, absolutely. There's, a, there's market forces at work there though. It's not the city saying you need to build more, more apartments, it's, it's people in the community that wanna move here that can't afford to buy. With the Wise City Council, I can let you know my part of that is to analyze in the comprehensive plan, and that's been alluded to a couple of times already in this discussion as well. We plan for where, where multifamily or higher density should go within the city. And we look at those requests when those projects come in. We say, is this somewhere where we planned for multifamily? We, uh, we really don't have a, a timeline on that or say this is too much right now or, or too little or recruit apartment developers or single family developers for that matter. Um, and let's see, uh, what is the city doing to control and properly locate alarming apartment growth and protect quality of life the city keeps bragging about? So I think some of that too is if we can maybe, we aren't gonna, the, the secret's out, right? Meridian's on the map, people are moving here, but maybe we can strategically grow. We aren't gonna stop growth, and I don't even know that we can control growth, but we can strategically grow, maybe in areas where we do have the infrastructure that can keep up. Uh, we're growing and maybe grow you know, from the inside out and then grow on the periphery really, rather than uh, all directions at once, so. Um, apartments. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what else to say on that. Um, we are definitely getting some feedback on, on apartments uh, through the conference. Uh, to some degree, that's being considered. Again, I, I don't know that the, you know, th and the vacancy rates are going to ebb and flow as well. But just looking again at some of the national trends and projecting those forward, again, more retiring baby boomers that are looking for smaller places, maybe even apartments, condominiums, those types of things are all lumped on to maintain a yard and those, those types of things or have a small family or they're single individuals that do have that. We're seeing that some of those trends uh, on the national level, um, again, are there gonna be vacancy rates? Sure. Um, but I think what, where we're at as far as the ratio goes with, with single family entitled um, but I'm not overly concerned that that ratio is out of whack then with, with what's in line as a national standard. 
Not yet anyways. If it continues this way, I might be r waving some red flags going, hey, well, this is yeah, a little crazy. Um, I would just challenge you to look, look at other communities and see what that ratio is. And I'm not saying let's be like all the other communities, um, but you do want to have a varied market. You want to you want to have choices for people. You don't all want to live in the same size lot, the same size house. You need to have some for some of what was just talked about. That the the variation. I'm not advocating for apartments, though. I mean, don't. <laughs> But we do need some, but yeah, it's, there's definitely more. So I don't know what the next question is. Do we want to move on if there are other questions? Do you want the mic back? Uh, we have had denials for apartment complexes and for housing developments. Um, um, primarily where they're located. Uh, as we do it, um, council wanted that to be um, considered through the comprehensive plan update. If the update said apartments made sense in that area, it should have been it should be part of that publicly involved process community right now. And um, there were a couple of issues that council cited in their denial. Um, the the setup. The phase, there was no phase plan. It was to have a lot of things that are considered when these developments go in front of city council that they take into account. They take comments from all public entities. They take um, all written testimony. And they also take, they want to make sure when council makes those decisions that, that we are able to serve that development with city services and that we consider the co the comments from the agent so um we had our our cub scout troop uh 132 uh with this question um i i think we've talked a lot about traffic did we answer your question space with us afterwards and, and we can have further conversations as well we are reactive. Um, the funding in the state of Idaho is reactive in its nature. When you have by building permit bases, it's hard to be proactive to get roads done before the growth is here. And certainly it is definitely hard to improve a road. And, um, we did learn something, gosh, I can't remember, how long ago it was, but we decided there was one area of our community we were not ready to grow in. And so we denied, a, and so we did learn that if we can steer that growth where we do have services, um, we're better off working with them and trying to figure out how we can make it an asset to our community because we will deal with the growth impacts for homes. Is that in front of council yet? Yeah. I, I don't know what this um, development is, uh, but the intersection of Black Hat and Cherry Lane is... is um I will. Um, I'm, uh, I'll just generally speak in, in terms, not of the project, but of that intersection, though, and it goes, again, to some of the same uh, answers we've had today. So the, the process is that a project, when it's submitted, is, is transmitted to the Ada County home that mitigates the, the impact. And I'll just I'll throw another quick number out there. Each home is anticipated to generate 10 vehicle trips per day. So a trip is going one place. The second trip would be coming home from that place. So that's two trips. And if you one trip is to work and you go to lunch at work, that's another trip. You can anticipate there, right? Do the math. Going through that intersection, we'll assume it's right on, on the corner. And that's essentially what ACH, it's not the only thing they look at. They look at where their access points are proposed and if there's any conflicts that way. Um, but that's the mitigation then that we receive as staff and write up a report. And I had a conversation recently with a gentleman um, about adequate. You know, what's adequate? Um, just quickly, uh, levels of service for roadways is almost like a report card A through F. Some of our roads are at double F, triple F, but they don't do that. F is F, but there is, Second something at an F, right? I mean, it's a little bit different than grade school. 
but, but, that, but that's the reality of it. Just because it's failing doesn't mean you go, ah, oh, it's failing. There are still some things you can do to bring that level of service up, even if it's still failing. I didn't explain that very well. But anyways, that's what, that's what the type of information we would get from, from ACH, the, the transportation uh, uh, point of view as we then uh, comprehensively give that to our Planning and Zoning Commission and Mayor and City Council. Uh, if you have any specific questions about that project, I don't know if the person that's Robert, my office, or Bill, but um, Lime Scooters are coming back. Uh, when they deployed them in our community, they didn't do any of the things they said they would do. They just, they did get an agreement with the city to, um, on the impact on, Bill? How many people know what Lime Scooters are? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that, that's the answer right there. So we did get we did get the do, and a lot of that some of that you're seeing probably now in whether it's the news or social media, uh, with the city of Boise and doing more outreach, getting people to know what they are, where they are, where they belong, and where they don't belong. We have tasked our internal staff in working with them to look at where they don't go. We also want to make sure that they're done safely and and they're parked in a place where they don't obstruct sidewalks, they don't obstruct handicap access and things like that, all the things they committed to doing before they started that they didn't do. So that's the reason for the pause, but they have been very committed to cooperating with us and trying to get this done in a better way than it was because they literally signed their agreement in September and two days later put them out on the sidewalk. No, no forewarning, no nothing. So that wasn't done very well. Inform and educate and make sure people do this properly. So. We are working with them, and hopefully by spring, this will roll out in a much more common sense, logical fashion for people. This will make sense for some folks. I will never ride a Lime scooter. If you see me on one of those, that's why the city council was receptive to this program, but it has to be done in a way that makes sense, and it doesn't impact people in a negative way, and that's where we're working with them now. Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. If somebody didn't hear, so currently under state code, motorized vehicles are not allowed on sidewalks. They can be allowed on sidewalks, like the city of Boise has chosen to allow that in certain, as well as the, the people in, in cars on the roadway. So there might be places that it would make some sense, and that's what we're evaluating. And there are definitely places where it doesn't make sense. The one thing we do not want them is parked on the sidewalk, because those obstruct passerbys, pedestrians, people in wheelchairs, traffic, and the heavy use of vehicle traffic probably is more dangerous for them to be on the roadway. So everybody sign up on Lime. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, watch our social media, watch the city website. We'll have more information out for people. Yes, sir. A quick question regarding that Permission. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was another thing they had committed to doing up front was that they would reach out to those businesses and locations, shopping centers and such, and find places where these can be and not just simply leave them there. Well, they didn't do that. And now they're on a where, where they have to do that. Want to. Yes, sir. Well, currently, well, the contract with the city, so the question is what type of fees are they paying? Right now what they have is an agreement simply to be able to use them on city property simply for parking or for use it would make more sense from an enforcement standpoint to deal with it because we still will be dealing with it to some degree that maybe a licensing requirement would then have a fee attached to doing this so that would reimburse the city for the cost of enforcement and dealing with problem users. Yes, Councilor. Just awesome. Love it when people show up to these. I stopped going to them because it was mostly city staff and we would talk for 90 minutes and then give you five minutes to ask some questions, so this is a way better setup. So, but when it comes to the scooters, um, when they're done properly, like kind of, I, Boise never, and they're extremely customizable. Lime didn't do it, turn on these features when they first just deployed them. Um, but for example, as I drove just, or as I rode one from 13th in front to the stadium, there was about three different zones that I passed. Two of them were 
circumstance where it knew it's a really high foot traffic area and so they had set up with the school beforehand that if you're going to be riding one through here it's going to go but it's just barely going to move and then as i kind of entered into a parking lot right by the stadium it was a uh, it shuts it off and so then it's like okay you're done you either need to <laughs> get safety in those circumstances where they may end up being allowed on certain sidewalks and whatnot um, so it's not just going to be 20 miles an hour all the time no matter what um, when we do work it out the proper way Um, make another note on the private property on their property that they'll be placing places where they can park so they don't find them all over their parking lots which is what was happening and it will be a little bit more orderly and these are a lot of the things that were supposed to have happened that had scout uh, questions and um, Robert in my office has been participating in a homelessness a round table discussion. Uh, homelessness has not just the, in, in the West State School District, they have a roof over their head, but they don't have one place of residency. Um, homelessness has a lot of additional support other than just housing that is needed. And that is the um, county seats. So, NAMPA has a lot of different services that go beyond just the shelter. They go into some of the social care, and so does Boise. And you look at some of the nonprofits that's homeless um, facilities because they need to be centralized in one place, typically one place in each county. So that's why you don't see a lot of that. Uh, we do have some programs through our community uh, grant program, and we work with a housing agency that um, supports countywide efforts. Did I answer your question? Any follow-up? We don't have the, the programs in Meridian. I, I can't answer that. But we probably could get you that. So if we can get your your information after this, uh, we can get some to you because of what those issues are. Uh, the expansion of the yumber, lumber yard on East Broadway. I. Where is Caleb? Because that has been a staff level. Um, known as Pro Build downtown on Broadway, just on the uh, other side of uh, Third. Third Street and, and downtown Meridian. Uh, they recently changed their name or rebranded to Builders First Source. Um, but they are uh, the user that's being talked about here and they're, they're building a new warehouse uh, from Third uh, for the past several years now. And they, they're consolidating, so all of their operations are on the other side of Third. Um, I'd rather not go into all the history of this property. It's owned by the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, Build the first source has a 30-day lease, basically it's renewable, the railroad that owns it, so it's, it's hard to get um, investment in that area. It's zoned industrial, and it has been for a long, long time. Just on the other side of Broadway are these residents. Uh, it's not an ideal situation. You typically, in my profession, you don't want to put industrial across the street. As a city, this, is a, this was a staff level approval. They had the zoning in place. Our zoning code allows that expansion. Um, there, w there were some things we did to work with them to mitigate some of that um, over time, like there's hours of operation. A lot of it is uh, just sort of a, a gentleman's agreement if you be good neighbors. Um, but the, the reality is there's, there's heavy machinery in and out of there. Um, and just again, the, the general nature of their operation isn't, um, it, it isn't ideal. Over time, this, this area is pl uh, potential retail uses if somebody can in fact acquire that land or redevelopment with a long-term guarantee to develop it or acquire the property outright. So um, it says you'd like to discuss. So if there's anything there, um, we did have conditions of approval. We're getting some sidewalks in there. So that discuss more or explore that more. I will say that um, the expansion to the east of this one of the things that I heard when they first started the discussion was they had um, some of their trucks queuing in the road in front of these residents to do those improvements. They have also improved that roadway and put in sidewalks, as I understand. 
curb gutter and sidewalk? On the one section. Yeah. yeah, and they're now parking on their own site. So there's some things that have been positive that for more um, internal to their lumber yard. The other thing, and anyone that drives in that area that has ever been stopped by a train, uh, the spur is being moved further to the east, so we don't anticipate that they'll then, okay. General, um, honoring kids. We, I work with the school district. I, I walk in the schools uh, a lot, yes. What school do you go to? Since they opened that school, in fact, my daughter was the top pacer in the school that year. She's very competitive as well. Um, but uh, I walk in all 16 schools and we do a competition. Um, that is one way that we work with the uh, schools to honor kids. We do have a Meridian Stars program. And the Meridian Stars program uh, recognizes good neighbors our unsung heroes that really are the one reasons that, that we recognize. And those youth that we have recognized every year have been phenomenal. Um, I am always open to suggestions and would love to work with your pack if there's a way that we can work. I recognize all Eagle Scouts when I learn about it and send a letter for their um, recognition ceremony. So there's, there's some things that we could do, and I'd be interested to hear your ideas as well. So we can meet at some point. Uh, those are the questions that we kind of wrapped in general terms. Are there additional questions? Yes, sir. That, that is a good point. Um, our parks director heard that comment, and so did one of the members on our golf course steering committee. Um, and we can have that conversation with those. Those, those should be better marked. All right. Anything, Doug or Ann, you want to add? No? Okay. Thank you. Um, We'll go first here. I, I share the concern of girls, um, most certainly. And you probably can ask different opinions as well. Uh, they all bring a unique perspective. Um, we have tried to to um, manage growth through extension of services, and that's one reason why um, you grow there. Um, we just approved a development on the west side of, of McDermott. Am I concerned? Yes, and, and council would say that. I, I do voice my opinion during their meetings, even though we are trying to work with our development community and as we have said probably a number of times through this, is we are guiding growth to where we do have those services and that capacity to um, have that growth. Do you have a follow-up question? gross sake in the conversations that our city council has. Um, but maybe we should ask any of our council members if they would like to comment on, on that. Council President? 
Joe Borton. I couldn't quite hear the question exactly. We're, I'm back in the cheap seats. Sure. Chicken or the egg, somewhat, right? Um, really, I think the, the pace of growth, for better or for worse, really is controlled uh, in large part by our decisions on council. A lot of that responsibility and the good and bad, perhaps, comes with us and our decisions. Um, it's not necessarily a circumstance where all of the infrastructure and everything that future growth needs is in place first, which then drives us to perhaps approve a new application. Really what our transportation planning and our, our uh, consolidated financial planning and our public infrastructure plan and our parks master plan. And, and we set the, the framework for the expansion of our city, which you could see today how that's planned. And then growth fills in in the court, wrong application or the wrong project, um, or perhaps it's too soon. So I think, quite frankly, it's more our responsibility uh, to make sure that applications that come in match all of the planning process that we have set. So um, when we city, and they want to join Meridian and expand the city boundaries, when they're doing that, it's done in, ac in accordance with the plan that we already have in place um, and a future land use map. So it's not um, kind of making it up as we go. It's, you know, are they, we have a, you know, the city planned out and the infrastructure and what we intend, but we don't control the private development and the economy that has a big factor in speed of what comes. So um, a lot of variables, but our job is to make sure that we review those in those, those benchmarks. So it's a tough question to answer. It's really not a black and white, um, an easy one. Hopefully, did that come close? Maybe. Might, might not like it, but may hopefully that's helpful somewhat. Appreciate you bringing that up. You bet. Yeah, so the, the comment is, and we hear this every now and then, which is if we appreciate hearing it is, um, are decisions made? Is, it, is the public input really not necessary and not part of the equation? Um, it's great for us to hear that because it keeps us grounded in, in when it's made available to us very seriously. So when we get an application and something comes to us, it's you know stage 46 of 46 steps. We get the tail end of it. Our planning staff and the development community have done uh, meetings and meetings and the school district and the highway district. And, um, when it comes to us in the city council meeting, I can guarantee you that not only um, does all of the public input that is provided in writing or in testimony at planning and zoning, we read everything. And if you've been to a council meeting, sometimes it's kind of clumsy and it takes a long time and we ask lots of questions of public input and it matters. And I think what I see um, Every now and then, if you get to a public meeting, I think you'll see any one of the six of us ask questions of citizens based on input that they might have provided at a planning and zoning meeting or a letter they wrote, which I, I and their concern with how this might impact their property. And, and that might not get recognized a lot, but I see it, I recognize it as an acknowledgement of, of all that input that maybe we don't do a good enough job of, of publicly sharing that we see it and we want their input, so. So, so the question is, is that all we do is read? Now, one of the realities is, is well, when we take public input, and I'll just, con I'll, I'll pass it back if you want. Now, not everyone believes that or likes that answer, uh, but the reality that, that uh, we get faced with is our decisions aren't unanimously approved and um, appreciated by every single person in every con. It, that's not really our charge. Well, now, now, I, I appreciate that input. Here's one of the challenges. Um, not everyone would agree with you. Okay. No, no. I didn't, but, but it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean what I get in, you know, and I'm not trying to debate it right now, but there's going to be times when you provide input to us and we'll disagree with you, and you won't like our decision. And, and that's probably true for most elected decisions. Our commitment has to be, are we listening? And, and, and what concern you might have in, in education is, is to listen to that, to try and understand where you're coming from. And, and perhaps we failed 
in how we communicate or made you aware of our process. And at the end of that discussion, we might disagree. And you might say, Joe, uh, you're wrong. I necessarily. But that's the, you know, that's, the, that's the process that we go through um, as elected officials to try and give everybody an opportunity to provide the input because it does matter. And you might not like the answer at the end, but, but please appreciate the fact that we want to listen. I'll hug the mic for a sec. I like the questions. Yes? Great question. If thank you for the questions. Certainly. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> uh, well, our call volume has gone up, uh, and uh, we've had our keeping lockstep fashion with the growth and with the uh, increased uh, amount of people and the calls. We are we're staying on top of it. Yes. In fact, at Station 4, we added a brand new Same thing. We, just, we, we try to meet those demands as best as we can. Um, you know, with more people, there's more calls for service, more needs. And, but, you know, keeping our fingers crossed, we've done a good job with that. So we're trying. And if anybody all interested, I have some pamphlets up here. We need a lot now and in the future. So. And, and I, I'm going to say something on behalf of our emergency responders because I think it's important to note that um, our city council established a level of service in different parts of our town that bring those response units closer to where people are living. Um, we are one of the safest cities in the state of Idaho and the safest for a city of our size. Uh, we rank nationally on safe systems very serious yes thank you and and so you will see that on in, in police that on a crimes per thousand we are ourselves up to date and abreast to those new trends and the new challenges they train our council adequately funds the training and so we, we take that service level very serious. Question that wasn't in the slide deck, and I had told the library, our, we have a library district. The library is not um, part of the city. However, one of those key agencies that we work with. And so the, the question that had been asked attempts to pass a bond so they can build new libraries. I think it's important that we do um, talk briefly on this because the library districts under state code have something really weird in it. have to spend it in that year. So they can't use, they can't save like the city does. We save before we spend. And we save over a period of time per our capital improvement plan. The library district can have impact fees and the only tool they have is also bonds or levies. And um, I thought it was important for that to be noted because they really are trying to figure out how to adequately respond. They do have some information over here. I would encourage you to, to grab it. And we do have a question on our Facebook Live. So the question, uh, Steve Sidaway, and, and he can tell you what we're up to. Thanks, Mayor. I'm Steve Sidaway. I'm the Parks and Recreation Director. And uh, uh, I'll take this opportunity to talk about pathways, because that's uh, uh, the, the off-street pathway network is something near and dear to my heart. Uh, we did a priorities for you, the citizens, and what you'd like to see um, in terms of parks and recreation services and amenities. And in question after question, the number one ranked uh, item on those questions was more pathways. As we've talked about before, having growth pay its way, when these new developments come in, we have an adopted pathways master plan, and those developments do have to build their segments of these pathways 
um, as, they, as they grow. Um, we have a growing but disconnected Recreation Commission, and the focus recently over the last uh, few years have been on what we call the Five Mile Creek Pathway. Uh, we've been making some great strides in getting that particular pathway uh, connected. You can see uh, part of that pathway uh, in front of Bridge Tower, built several sections there. Uh, we continue to try and make uh, segments along that more connected and uh, to build that, that, that pathway network. Um, we try and invest uh, the dollars we have the, in, in places where a, a small investment can make a sections that we're, where we can build a small connection and connect a, a larger section up. But uh, I think that's probably my, my main update uh, on, on how we focus on that. Um, and if anyone has any specific questions, I'll stick around afterwards to help answer them. Thanks, Mayor. Okay. It's in the back. Becky, I'll get you later. Um, so the question is uh, about and, and, and Boise. Uh, there, there is a, a valley um, planning entity called Valley Regional Transit that was formed by the voters uh, years ago to focus on public transportation. There's no funding mechanism for that. So there are master plans and um, there are um, discussions about various tools and what those tools could be, it, but those tools to say, um, what can we do uh, with the resources that we have? And in the city of Meridian, we worked with um, Valley Regional Transit and a group of stakeholders in mobility challenges. And so through that work group, was birth a public private or I guess a nonprofit um, public partnership and it's called Harvest Transit because Meridian taxpayers are paying for that. But that was the, the way we thought we could work public transportation on the limited resources that we have to have the biggest impact for those that really need those services. And and that's going to, to grow that number from around 850 trips a month to over 300 or 1350. So we are making a difference with that program. That is in partnership with Valley Regional Transit provide the drivers. It's a, it's a great partnership and um, right now it fills an important gap as we try and figure out the longer term. So thank you for that question. And thank you all. Hang around. Uh, we do have people you can talk one or evening with us on some